All right. So welcome everybody to the first Copenhagen Jerusalem Combinatorics Seminar after the summer break. Uh, nice that so many people already showed up, and I guess few might join still. Um, for today's talk, we have Shoham from London, or actually sitting in Cambridge, as I heard, talking about hypergraphs with no tight cycles. Shoham, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for inviting me. Um, and thank you guys for coming. Um, right. So it feels like I just since I gave an online talk, it's been maybe a month and a half. Uh, but this was an intensive year. So um, hopefully I can still do it. Anyway, um, right. So, so I'll be talking about hypergraphs with no tight cycles. Um, so to start, um, let's I'll remember this um, like easy fact from graph theory. Uh, so suppose I'm interested in constructing a graph which does not have a cycle where the cycle is something that looks like this, right? Um, so the best thing that I can do in terms of the number of edges is, um, is a tree, oops. Um, Right, so the best thing I can do is to have a graph with well, the largest number of edges I can have without creating cycles um, on n vertices is n minus one edges, right? So here are some examples of trees. Okay, um, so assume everybody has seen this in some basic graph theory course. Um, but what we want to do is to try to generalize this fact or just try to um, understand what happens when we look at, um, at the same question, but for hypergraphs. Right, so, okay, what do I mean by hypergraphs? I mean, um, so the terminology that I will use is, um, I will say an R graph to mean an R uniform hypergraph. This is an hypergraph whose edges consist of R vertices. Right, so an R uniform hypergraph has a bunch of vertices and each edge is a set of R vertices. So for example, um, this guy is an example of a three graph. So I, the colors don't really mean anything, they're just to make it easier to see. All right, um, so, so these are my hypergraphs and here is the question. What is the maximum possible number of edges in an R graph on n vertices, which has no cycles, right? So exactly kind of trying to generalize this, right? But before, before trying to think about um, the solution to this question, we really have to think about the phrasing of the question, namely, uh, what does it mean a cycle in um, a hypergraph? So in graphs, it's sort of, kind of clear what the cycle is, but turns out that in hypergraphs, you can make various definitions and um, you get, I guess, different answers to this question. Right, um, so we will be looking at kind of three main notions. I guess you can define some other things, but we won't talk about them. So the three notions are burst cycles, loose cycles, and tight cycles. Okay. Um, so what is a burst cycle? Um, it's defined like this, or this is one way to define it. Um, so a burst cycle can be defined by a sequence E1, V1, E2, V2, where the EIs are edges and the VIs are vertices and all these guys are distinct, uh, such that each vertex is in the edges before it and after it. Um, okay, so here is a way to visualize them, visualize this, these uh, burst cycles. Um, so these guys will be my vertices. So let's call them V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5. And my condition says, uh, well, maybe um, kind of a better way to state this is that every two consecutive vertices are in an, in an edge, but anyway, um, that's here's the drawing. So we need V1 and V2 to be in a certain edge. So here is the edge that contains them. I need V2 and V3 to be in 
an edge. I need V3 and V4 to be an edge, but I cannot use the pink one because I already use it for these guys. So I define a new one, etc. Uh, so this is a bridge cycle. So first, a sanity check if um, if R equals two. So I'm talking about graphs. Then just defining the vertices kind of defines my cycle because I need there to be an edge that contains these two, but that uniquely defines the edge and so on. Okay. Um, so maybe the definition looks a bit funny, but it generalizes in some way what happens for graphs. Okay. Um, right. And I claim that the answer to the question, so the question still appears here, what is the maximum possible number of edges in an R graph on a vertices which does not have a burst cycle in this case. So we're looking at burst cycles. Uh, so I claim that the answer to this question is this number, n minus one over r minus one, round it down. Um, right. So this is kind of just an exercise. Um, so to see the upper bound, well, I won't prove this fact exactly, but I claim that it's not hard to see that if we have no burst cycle, then I can order the edges um, as E1, E2, et cetera, such that each edge EI um, has at most one vertex in common with the previous edges E1 up to EI minus one. Um, so this is kind of similar to what happens with trees. It's this, this proof sort of generalizes just what happens for graphs. Um, so maybe one reason why this is a nice notion to have. Okay, uh, so given this, let's just do the calculation to see that indeed this is the number of edges that we get. Um, right. So we have that the number of vertices is at least R for the first edge. So the first edge contributes R new vertices plus R minus one times N minus one. Um, so each of the Whenever I expose an edge, I know that maybe it has one vertex in common with the previous one, but other previous ones. Sorry, could um, you scroll down just a little bit? We don't see the. Oh, sorry, sorry. Variety, no worries. Ah, wonderful. Thanks. Also, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really say it, um, explicitly, but feel free to stop me if something isn't clear or I go too fast or something. Um, right. So just doing the calculation, we're looking at the number of vertices. We know that the first edge gives us R new vertices and each of the next edges gives us R minus one vertices because I know that every edge has at most one vertex in common with the previous ones. So it contributes R minus one. Um, okay, and then just rearranging this is, I guess, R minus one times N minus one plus one and rearranging, I get that. Um, Sorry, like this. And rearranging, I get that M is at most N minus one over R minus one. And because it's an integer, I'm done. All right. Um, so, anyway, this is kind of looks similar to what happens for trees and also like to see the lower bound. What you get is things that look like trees. Um, right, so basically, in order to get to this bound, what you want to do is have equality here as long as possible, like maybe you have some parity issues, so maybe you have some extra vertices, but otherwise, you're trying to always have um, exactly one vertex in common with the, with the previous edges, so this is what you get here. Um, okay. So burst cycles are kind of nice because they just generalize what happens with trees and graphs. Um, however, it's, it's just an exercise. So uh, probably not enough to fill uh, one hour talk. So maybe we should, should try a different notion. So let's talk about um, loose cycles next. All right, so what is a loose cycle? Um, this we can define, so we can define a loose cycle by a sequence E1, E2, et cetera, of edges. 
such that consecutive pairs of edges have a vertex in common. Um, right, so here are my edges, consecutive ones have a vertex in common, and edges that are not consecutive um, are disjoint. So this gives us a much more kind of rigid structure. If I tell you that I have a loose cycle of length five, then this is the only way your, my loose cycle could look like. Um, and again, when you plug in r equals two, then you just get the usual definition of the cycle. Right, uh, so these are loose cycles. And then again, we want to ask how many edges can I have in a graph, in an R graph, which does not have any loose cycles. Um, and this is no longer easy, but um, the answer is no, at least for large enough N. Um, so this is a result by Frankel and Fordy. They show that the maximum number of edges in an R graph on N vertices, which has no loose cycles is um, this value, N minus one, choose R minus one. Um, and actually what they proved is a bit stronger. They showed that um, if there are no loose triangles, where triangle is just a cycle of length three, so something that looks like this, then uh, the number of edges is at most n minus one, choose r minus one. Right, uh, so this is the answer, um, this for a large enough n. And let's just see the lower bound because it's very easy. Um, so for the lower bound, I can define a hypergraph um, H whose vertices are um, one up to N and whose edges are um, R sets or R subsets of um, vertices. that contain one, right? So my vertices are just whatever, um, a bunch of N vertices, let's say label them one up to N. Um, and my edges are all, um, all the sets of R vertices that contain a particular one. And then you can see like, even for a loose triangle, you cannot, I mean, you won't have that all the edges contain one particular vertex. So indeed, this construction avoids um, loose cycles. And also um, we can observe that it's, it again kind of generalizes what happens for R equals two because um, this example for R equals two is just a star, right? But unlike, the, unlike with burst cycles where we had, you know, kind of a family of examples, um, if I remember correctly, at least this is this is the only um, the only extremal example. So it it generalizes what happens for graphs, but in a slightly different way. So it kind of generalizes stars rather than generalizing um, trees. All right. Uh, so again, this this is like harder than what we had in the previous slide, but it's known. So again, we should um, try to move on. So let's move on to tight cycles. All right. Um, so tight cycle uh, can be defined by a sequence v1, v2, and so on of distinct vertices, such that every r consecutive ones uh, form an edge. So here I drew just part of a tight cycle. So I have my vertices. Let's number them um, v1, v2 and so on. And I want every three consecutive ones to form an edge. So one, two, three, form an edge, two, three, four, form an edge, um, and so on. Like I go around and I only didn't draw everything because then it would be harder to see. All right, so kind of similar to a tight cycle, but here we don't skip vertices. We fill everything up. Um, good. And again, my question is um, like, how many edges can I have in 
an R graph on N vertices, which does not have a tight cycle. And I'll denote the answer to this question by F sub R of N um, for convenience. Okay, so F sub R of N is the maximum number of edges I can have in an R graph on N vertices with no tight cycles. And I want to investigate this function. Okay, um, so this is a bit of a longer story. So let's start in a new slide with the lower, lower bounds. Um, and the first thing to observe is that we have, we can have the same bound, same lower bound as we had for loose cycles. Uh, so this n minus one choose r minus one is again a lower bound for this function. Um, and the proof is the same as before. Just write down this graph on n vertices where all, whose edges are all r sets of vertices that contain a particular vertex. Um, and again, this, this thing won't have any tight cycles. Okay, um, but is this best possible? So it might be kind of tempting to say, well, maybe it is because that would be nice. That would again, generalize what, generalize what happens um, for R equals two. And indeed, um, Shosh and Verstrat independently both uh, conjectured that um, this function f sub r of n should be n minus one choose r minus one for large enough n at least. Right, um, so nice conjecture, I guess, but turns out to be false. Um, and this was disproved by Huang and Ma who showed that um yeah the the real number is at least a factor a, a constant factor away from this so at least like the right bound is at least one plus epsilon times this thing um yeah so they okay they they got away from this by a constant factor but maybe not like a massive constant factor at most two. Uh, and more recently, uh, Barnabas Janser came up with a very nice construction that um, gets away, that like replaces this constant factor by this log n over log log n type factor. Right? So just notice that n minus one choose r minus one is order of magnitude of n to the r minus one. So here I just added a constant factor and here uh, this log and over log log. Right, um, yeah, so, so this is really a nice construction and currently the best known lower bound. So let's move on to talk about upper bounds. Um, so until recently, this is what was known. Um, so the first thing is a result of Erdash um, and that result implies this bound. So notice that like trivially, um, F sub R of N is at most N choose R, which is order of N to the R, just because I don't have space for more than this many edges. Um, and this result of Erdős tells me that, tells us that this R is not the right, um, the right exponent of N, uh, but cannot criticize Erdes too much for not getting a tight bound here because he was looking at a different question. He looked at uh, the to run number of K222. So the complete R part height, R graph with parts of, of size two. Um, and there I believe, believe this, this number is, is correct. So this is just a consequence, this bounds with a consequence of what he did. Um, and then another um, bound that existed was due to Verstrat. Um, and it gives an improvement in the case R equals three. And again, he looked at a particular case. So I think he looked at the Turan number or Let's say he looked at forbidding a particular cycle. 
So forbidden tight cycle of um, length 24. Anyway, right. So, so this is what was known, I guess, not very much in terms of the upper bound um, until pretty recently when uh, Benny Sudakov and Ishtan Toman proved the following. They showed that F sub R of N is at most N to the R minus one times this uh, lower order term E to the constant square root N. All right, so this thing is like N to the little o of one. And since we have a lower bound of roughly n to the r minus one and an upper bound of roughly n to the r minus one. This kind of tells us, uh, well, this tells us something about the behavior of f sub r of n, or in other words, at least more precisely, it tells us what the right exponent of n is. So it tells us that f sub r of n is equal to n to the r minus one plus a little of one. Good. Uh, so now we kind of know quite a lot more than before about this function and my contribution is to, um, well, improve this. So here is my bound. Um, I can show that F sub R of N is at most some constant times N to the R minus one times uh, log N to the five. Um, which, yeah, which is relatively close to this. So we still have like a polylog factor between the best known upper bound and best known lower bound. Right, uh, any questions? Good, so um, what I want to do next is to talk about the proof of this. Um, and I should be able to say quite a lot, so I'll hide some details, but kind of tell you the full proof, won't give us some details. Um, but first, let's let's talk about um, some kind of easy step. Okay. Um, let me, I'll just refresh the sharing because I see that my scrolling is a bit slower. All right. Um, Okay, so, so let's talk for a bit about R partite R graphs. Uh, so I haven't written the definition, but I kind of drew it. So an R partite R graph is, um, has a partition, it has a partition of the vertices into R sets. Okay, so, an R partite R graph comes with a partition of the vertices into R sets, and every edge, every edge has exactly one vertex from each part. Okay, so very similar to bipartite graphs, kind of generalization of that. Um, okay, um, and here is uh, an easy claim. Uh, so suppose that I have um, a, an R graph on M edges, then I claim that this R graph contains a sub hypergraph H prime on um, at least this many edges. So a constant factor away from M, which is R partite. Okay, so the proof is, as follows, um, I'll write some of it. So pick randomly a partition A1 up to AR of the vertices of H and take H prime to consist of edges that intersect each AI in exactly one vertex. 
Okay. Um, so that's effectively the proof. Just take a random partition, take the arbitrate R graph uh, sub hypergraph that um, is formed by this partition and just check that the expectation expected um, number of edges in H prime is equal to this thing. Okay, uh, so standard um, probabilistic trick. But what that means is that basically, if since we don't care about constant factors, like we're not anywhere near nailing down the constants, uh, we don't care about losing constant factors. So we can always assume that our, our graphs are arbitrary. So um, our aim becomes the following. Suppose that I'm given an arbitrary R graph with, uh, I'll, I'll denote its partition by A1 up to AR on N vertices, which has at least this many edges, D times N to the R minus one, where D is at least this large, at least some large constant times log N to the five. Then uh, I want to show that my edge contains a tight cycle. And that, that would prove, um, yeah, that would prove my theorem because if I start with just an R graph, which is not R per tight, I can lose a small, con lose a constant factor and get my R per tight R graph, which has no cycles. All right. Um, all right, so this is my aim. Now, um, just a little bit of notation that comes from this. Uh, so it will be convenient to, given an edge, to represent it as an R tuple X1 up to XR, such that XI is in AI. So this is a convenience of having this um, partition, like it gives me an ordering of the vertices in an edge. Um, and then I'll say the following, given an edge E, um, which is equal to x1 up to xr and an edge f, which is y1 up to yr, then a tight path from e to f is a tight path that starts with e and ends with f um, and starts by starting with e, I mean starts with these vertices in this order. So this is, I don't know if it will be really easy to see, but it, in, from the proof, but this is important to have this um notion of like ordering of the vertices so again i say that i um have a tight path from e to f if i start from e so this is my e i have a tight path that starts from e ends at f and this is an order and the reason this is so this this order thing is important is because if i have a path p uh, from E to F and a path Q from F to H, then I can concatenate them uh, to get a path from E to H. Well, assuming I don't have repetitions, right? So I would have a tight path going here and a tight path going here. And assuming I don't have some vertices that repeat here and here, then this concatenation would give me a tight path. But for this, yeah, it's really important that these guys come are in the same order in the path here and the path here. Good. Um, okay, so before talking about my proof, I'll talk a bit about um, what Benny and Ishtman did. Um, and this is related to a notion of expansion. Okay, uh, so this is, I guess, um, like, a, yeah, like a main lemma in their, um, their paper, which is really not stated in this form, but I think this is better, um, well, easier to explain anyway. Right, so what I showed is that given um, my age, which is an R tight R graph with many edges, I can find within it a subhypergraph G such that um, for every edge E in G, 
and every small set of vertices B, which for technical reasons is disjoint of E. Um, then, okay, so given an edge and given, let's, let's maybe do a drawing. So given I have my edge E and I have my small set B of bad vertices, then this lemma tells me that, well, in my hyper G, for almost every edge uh, in, in this G, there is a short tight path going from E to F that avoids P. Right. Um, so let's try to draw this. Okay, so here is my edge E that I want to start with. Here are some vertices that I don't like and I want to avoid. And what this lemma tells me is that for almost every other, um, other edge F, there is some way to walk from E to F via a short tight path. Okay, so this is, I mean, the reason, okay, they, they define expander in a kind of more formal way, but, but this is a notion of expander. Like I, from any particular edge, I can reach almost every other um, edge in my hypergraph and even with the robustness where I can avoid the small set of vertices. Okay. Um, so, so this idea of using expanders is, um, not new. So this happens many times that you have some kind of, you start with some kind of uh, graph with large average degree, and then within it, you find an expander. And then within it, you find a certain substructure that you like. So maybe like a minor or something. Um, and there are, there are like standard proofs for finding an expander. Uh, but in this case, well, obviously these are not graphs anymore. These are hypergraphs. Uh, so you need to be a little bit clever in order to be able to use the kind of standard techniques for finding expanders here. Um, so I'll say very little, but just a few words about this. So what they do is they define a notion of R line graphs, uh, which are just graphs that are associated with these hypergraphs. And they're kind of similar to line graphs, if you know what they are. Uh, but they take into account this R part tightness. And then they, like this is maybe the clever bit where they define a notion of density that I won't, I won't explain. But that notion of density uh, works well with this standard technique. Um, and they define expanders for these R line graphs. And that basically translates to this lemma. OK, um, so they have this. Yeah, quick question, sorry. So, yeah. so in this lemma, so which, so this hypergraph is an expander or, or in general, like what is? Expander? Yeah, 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 right. I didn't, I didn't define. So this basically, this graph G will be my expander. Um, yeah, you're right, good question. Um, and yeah. So basically, yeah, this goes like the usual things. I have some graph or hypergraph with many edges. Within it, I find like a, a nice sort of a thing that expands well, which would be my G. And then I try to work within this expander. Okay, uh, and the definition of expander they are using is given in the in their article, right? Okay. Yeah, they're used. Yeah, they really don't define it. This way. They define it via these R line graphs, but I just okay. didn't. Okay. I didn't okay. want to go that route. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'll take a look. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't want to go that route because that no, means that's okay. defining a lot of things. Um, okay. Anyway, yeah. So I call such a G an expander. I didn't. So by such a G, I mean effectively this. Uh, so from every, I can. From every edge, I can reach almost every other edge via a short tight path while avoiding a small set of vertices. This is for me an expander. Um, okay, but but what their definition is effectively, I think, the same, just restated in the notion of line graphs. Anyway, um, so they have the expanders and then they want to work with them. Um, so normally the hope is to take your expander and find your thing within it. And that's what they, 
kind of set out to do, but doesn't exactly always work. Um, so they prove the following essentially. So they prove that given an expander, um, I guess dense enough expander, either they can show that for every two edges, there is a tight path from the first edge to the other edge, um, which, okay, the way I state it doesn't exactly show it, but this would give a cycle at least using using their technique. So this would imply that there exists a tight cycle. Um, and this is not the same as the definition of expansion. So the definition of expansion said, if I start with an edge, I can reach almost every F, uh, but not all Fs. And here, this they're looking, going for something slightly stronger. I can reach from every edge E, I can reach every edge F, um, I guess using a short path, whatever. Um, this is not very precise. Uh, but anyway, so, so either they can find their tight cycle using this thing, uh, but sometimes they cannot, at least using their techniques. And then what they do is they find a smaller but dense or denser subhypergraph and they kind of iterate. So they have their expander, they try to find the cycle here, maybe they fail, so they find a smaller expander and then continue. Um, and this sort of process is called density increment. Um, and that's, this is where they're bound of e to the um, constant squared log n comes from. So somehow you have to iterate over over this theorem and it gives you it gives you this is what comes out oh, anyway so i have yeah. a short question so you say that this first statement when you have these tight paths between any two edges should imply that there is a tight cycle yeah i think the way i wrote things it doesn't but oh okay uh, the way they do it i see okay it does yeah i don't know um i think maybe what they do first i guess i mean uh short probably. Okay. Uh, and second, so I had this, like I said, for every edge E, I have this bad set of vertices and then I can reach F. Uh, but I think maybe like they can have some kind of a dynamic set of bad vertices or something and then that allows you to connect back. Okay, I see. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it, it, I, I realize it shouldn't be exactly clear from the way I define things. Yeah, but. Sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, effectively, that they want some. If they had something like this, then they would be happy. But they they don't have it. Um, all right. So what I managed to do is effectively eliminate this uh, density increment. So I show that if I'm given an expander directly within it, I can find my tight cycle. I don't need to. Uh, like I don't have this failure of. I don't have a failure mechanism that goes into um, finding denser subhypergraphs. Um, right, so we show, I actually show slightly more. I show that not only I have a tight cycle, oops, but I have many tight cycles. So I can find a tight cycle through almost every two edges. Um, but I don't manage to prove this. So this is actually not still not clear if you can literally connect any two edges. Um, right, so I don't know if there is an application that directly needs this, but somehow this, I kind of find a way to circumvent it rather than prove it. Good. Um, right, so, so this is what I wanted to say about what they do and now I want to show, uh, well, what I do. Um, okay, so the first thing is kind of getting something a bit stronger out of this expansion definition. Uh, and I call this robust reachability. Okay, so here is again this definition or semi definition of an expander, but this time with a few parameters. Um, so I say that G is an expander with M edges if for every edge E in my expander and every set B 
of size at most this L squared over epsilon, uh, where again, this P has to be this joint of E. Um, for at least one minus epsilon times M of the edges F in my expander, there is a tight path from E to F of length at most L that avoids the set P. So this is exactly what I said before, but I plugged in some numbers this time. So again, I didn't really, obviously in my paper, I write what L is and so on, but um, didn't want to do it here. Okay, um, so my proof has these kind of two um, key steps and here is the first one. So we get a strengthening of this, um, which okay, maybe I'll explain by picture first. So I have my E, I have my bad, bad vertices that I want to avoid. Uh, oh no, sorry, I guess in this I, I, I somehow don't need this. So anyway, uh, I have my E. Um, this, def this definition or this assumption tells me that I can reach for almost every F. Um, I can go from E to F in a short, tight path. And what my lemma is going to say is um, I can do that. So I have a path from here to here, a path from here to here, etc. But I can do it more, but moreover, I can do it in such a way that no vertex is overused. So I, I kind of think of these paths, I think of them as a collection and I want to make sure that there isn't a vertex that is used in all the path. Okay, um, so here is the statement. So um, in an expander, so in a, in a graph G like this, uh, for every edge E, there is a set Fe um, of like reachable edges of size at least one minus epsilon times M and path P of E and F, so a path from E to F, um, so this path is of length L from E to F, um, and this collection satisfies that no vertex uh, appears in more than this many path P, path P of E and F. Okay, uh, except, so obviously I cannot avoid the vertices in E appearing in all the paths, but other than that, this collection is such that <coughs> no vertex appears more than epsilon times m over l path. All right. So uh, I guess I will um, prove this lemma and then uh, show how to use it. So let's prove the lemma. Um, good. So the proof is kind of um, not very hard. What I'm going to do is just take a maximal collection f of e that um, satisfies this, namely it has this collection of path where no vertex appears too many times. Um, okay, so so here, here it is, f of e is a maximal collection of edges such that there are path p of e and f of length at most l from e to f such that uh, no vertex appears more than epsilon times m over l paths. And my goal is to show that this f of e is at least this large. Okay, um, but first let's make this definition. Let's let b be the set of vertices that appear in exactly this many paths. So I know that there is no vertex that appears more than epsilon times m over l paths. Uh, let B be this kind of dangerous vertices that appear exactly the allowed number of times. Um, so let's do a calculation. Um, the size of B is at most the sum. So at most the total number of vertices that appeared in my paths, right, over the I can probably not see. Okay. 
right? So, okay, so again, the, the set of vertices that appear exactly this many times is at most the total number of vertices that appeared on my paths over this um, number, like allowed number of times. And here I know that my paths have length at most L. I know that there are at most M of them because M is the number of edges. So F of E is at most of size M um, over epsilon M over L. And this is L squared over epsilon. Okay, so we get this bound. B is at most of size L squared over epsilon, um, which is not a coincidence. So here, yeah, the, this appears again in this definition of expansion. So L squared over epsilon is exactly the number of vertices that I can avoid using this notion of expansion. Okay, so again, F of E is like a maximal collection of reachable um, edges. B is the set of dangerous vertices, vertices that are not overused, but almost overused. Um, and that's it. And now I apply just the normal, well, the definition of expansion that I stated above, uh, which tells me that if I have an edge, so that notion told me that if I have an edge and a small set of bad vertices, then I can reach almost every other edge by a short path. Okay, so in kind of formally, this notion of expansion tells me that there is a set F prime of E um, of at least one minus epsilon M edges. And for each of these edges, there is a path P prime of E and F of length at most L that goes from E to F and avoids B. Okay, so this is, so here I'm just applying this notion of expansion um, and now we can finish. So our goal was to show that this guy has size at most one minus epsilon n. So suppose not, suppose uh, this guy f of e has size less than one minus epsilon n. Then there must be um, an edge that appears in this f prime, but not in f. So let's take this f prime that appears in um, an edge f prime that appears in this f prime, but not in f. Good. Um, and now I claim we get contradiction. So I'm going to take the set f of e. This was my maximal set. I'm going to add this new edge to it. Um, and for these guys, I already had my paths p of e and f. And for this new guy, I just give this new path that comes, comes from here. And I claim this contradicts the maximality. Why? Because I know, uh, I know that if I discount this f prime, no vertex is overused. But if I add f prime, if I add this guy, it doesn't use these vertices that were in danger of being overused. Like it only, um, it only uses those vertices that are used like one fewer than this. So it doesn't, it doesn't cause a vertex to be used too many times. Okay, um, so this is the proof of dilemma. So basically we took this notion of expansion and used it as a kind of black box to get a slightly stronger um, notion. Good, um, so now this is just kind of a repetition of everything that we have. So this is the standard um, notion of expansion that's Benny and Istvan give. Um, this is what I set out to prove. So I want to prove that uh, given an expander like this, it contains a tight cycle. Uh, and here is my lemma, which gives us kind of strengthening of this. Uh, and now I want to put everything together. Um, Right, so do people want a break or should I just continue? I am fine with continuing, but I guess if somebody wants a break, now is Was this a continue or a break? I, I'm fine with continuing, thank you. Okay, uh, cool. So I will, I will do that. Um, 
okay, so now we go, we just prove this theorem. Uh, good, so first step is just to um, apply this lemma. So apply it for each edge. So for each of my edges in my expander, I take this f of e, which is the kind of set of, or a set of size one minus epsilon m, which has associated with it a collection p of e and f of tight path that are short and where no vertex is overused. Right. Um, okay, so, so if I think about, let's think about this auxiliary graph whose vertices are the edges of G. And now I'm going to put an edge between F and E if, um, so EF is an edge in my auxiliary graph. If um, F is in, f of e okay so it's just me but i can see what you oh yeah sorry so... this happens I'll, I'll just refresh okay. that. sherry thank you yeah thanks. yeah now i see uh, it yeah okay so again um Let's say I just do, I, I write this auxiliary graph where I put an edge from E to F, if um, F is an F of E, then what, what this tells me is that, that if I look, if I start to move my E and I look at its um, out neighborhood, well, first I know that it's large. So this, this digraph is kind of um, super dense. But also I know that if I look at the paths associated with these edges, each, each of these edges is kind of associated with this path P, E of F, then I know that no vertex is used too many times. Um, and then my plan would be to kind of like find a directed cycle or let's say a directed triangle in this graph is what I'm going to do. Um, that co corresponds to a tight cycle. Um, and the kind of problem, like if you try to play around with this definition, the problem that you uh, might arrive at, or that at least I arrived at, is that if I, instead of looking at the out neighborhood, I look at the in neighborhood. So I know this graph is super dense, so almost every vertex has very large in neighborhood. So now I look at F and I look at its in neighborhood. It's no longer true that uh, if I look at the paths associated with these edges, somehow they won't have this property. Like it could be that there is one vertex that is used in all these paths. And that's somehow inconvenient. When I also I don't to... see the screen right now. Again, no, this is, this is a bit annoying. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I sorry about this. I don't really know how to resolve it. Um, other than just restart the sharing. Anyway, right. So, um, yeah, talking about an out neighborhood, I know that path associated with outgoing edges have this kind of nice property that no vertex is used too many times. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said about in neighborhoods. And when you try to sort of chain these things together, lap around, that's a problem. Um, right, so the way to overcome it is um, as follows, all right, that's the first step. So for an edge F in my graph G, I look at, so I will look at these in neighbors and I will identify those vertices that are over you. They cannot, like there may be some vertices like this, but I'll just, um, identify them, put them in a bag, and, um, and that will be helpful. Okay, so I have my F, 
which is an edge in my expander, I define B of F to be the set of vertices that appear on um, at least epsilon M over L path P um, from E to F. Okay, and the, I wrote it kind of differently, but the same calculation that we did um, in the proof of this lemma will give me that the set B of F is small. So there may be vertices that appear in too many paths, but because the paths are short, uh, there cannot be that many vertices doing this. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to define a new collection of paths. So I have my path P of E and F. Now I'm going to define a new collection. Um, right. So given an edge E, by expansion, I know that for at least one minus epsilon times M of the edges. Um, oh, sorry, I guess, yeah, sorry, I fixed my F. Then my expansion tells me that for at least one minus epsilon times M edges E, there is a path Q of, of F and E that has length at most L and goes from F to E and avoids the set of bad vertices. Right, so this is kind of just a standard notion of expansion. I have a reversed my roles of F and E. Right, so I have my F, I have these guys that appeared too many times on path corresponding to the in neighborhood. Uh, so I just try to avoid them. And then expansion tells me that for almost every edge E, I can walk from F to E in a short way. Good, and now I'm going to try to put these P's and F's and Q's together to form a cycle. So to do that, I need the following thing. Right, so the claim says that for almost every pair E of E, e and F of edges uh, in my expander, I have that Q of F and E is defined. And also um, there are many edges H such that both P of E and H is defined and P of H and F is defined. And also I can put them together to get a tight cycle. Right, so um, in other words, Okay, so what I mean by this is I have, okay, so I know I have my edge E, I know I have F, H, and I have F, and I have a tight cycle, a tight path associated from E to F, from E to H, I have a tight path from F to A, from H to F, getting confused. Um, okay, so I have this tight path, I have a tight path here, and this concatenation is a tight path is just the same as saying that there is no vertex that kind of is shared here and here. So this is effectively the same as saying that um, P of E and H and P of H and F don't share vertices outside of H. Okay, um, good. So let's make a drawing for this claim. This claim says that for almost every E and F, firstly, I'll have this, um, this path Q of F and E is defined. And also I have a large collection of edges such that um, this guy is defined and this guy is defined and they can be used to form a tight path. And then it should be kind of evident what our plan is. Our plan is to loop around like this. Okay, um, so this is the claim. So we have no, okay, I guess I made a drawing trying to explain this. Um, right, so what we have to do is two things. First, we have to prove the claim. And second, we have to show that 
if these two things happen, then I can indeed form my tight cycle like this. Okay, um, so let's start by proving the claim. So let's notice that we know that this holds um, for at least one minus epsilon m squared pairs EF. So all that we need to do is to show that this thing also holds for almost every pair EF and then putting these two things together, I will get that almost every pair satisfies both of these conditions. All right. Okay, uh, so I'm going to define an auxiliary graph as follows. So this is, I fix my E, I define D of E to be a digraph whose vertices are the edges in the expander. And H F is an edge whenever um, essentially this happens. So whenever P of E and H is defined, P of H and F is defined, and I can put them together to form a tight path. And effectively, if you think of B, what B says is that um, B is the same as saying that, um, yeah, I guess, well, it will, B is this, essentially the same as saying that D of E is very dense. Okay, we'll see this in a minute. Um, right. Okay, um, what's happening here? So I'm going to look at, um, okay, I want to show that this guy is dense. So let's look at just an out, the out degree of um, an edge in this graph. So let's look at an edge for which this guy is defined, P of E and H is defined. Then I claim that this edge has very large out degree in my digraph. Okay, um, so this out degree, well, we have an edge whenever these two guys are paths. So we already have this first one. So we need to guarantee that this guy is a path and also that I can put them together. So basically this thing counts, um, right, the first thing. So this counts the number of ifs such that this guy is defined. So we then manage to satisfy this and this. Uh, and now we want to also satisfy this guy. Um, and, or in other words, we can subtract the number of times when this is not satisfied. And this is not satisfied exactly when uh, these two guys share a vertex that is not in H. So I have this sum V over uh, the edges in this path from E to H, uh, where V is not in H. And I'm going to count how many Fs are such that V is in P of H and F. Um, and here is where we use this robust reachability. Okay, so I have, this is my path from E to H. Um, and let's say I picked some vertex here. So I picked my V and I want to say, well, I want to lower bound an upper bound on the number of Fs such that this V is contained in this age of F. But this is sorry, there's no writing again. Thank you. Um. Okay. Um yeah, I wonder if maybe it's better to join the iPad as a participant in Zoom, but I guess I'll try it next time. Um, all right, so I fixed my V and I want an upper bound on this number, but this is exactly like the upper bound that we had before. So we chose our collection of these paths going out from H in such a way that no vertex appears many times 
So this is this is exactly where I need this robust reachability. Um, so I get an upper bound. This was L squared over epsilon. Um, right. This is and okay. And here I have at most. No, I feel like I got this wrong. Let's have a look. Um, yeah. So this was. Sorry, this was epsilon m over L, right? So I chose my collection of these guys with H fix so that no vertex appears more than this many times. So if I fix my vertex, I can only have at most epsilon m over L um, edges f that, that are bad that contain, contain my V. Um, the sum is over at most L things because my path has length at most L. And finally, this thing is at least uh, one minus epsilon M, um, right? Because, because this guy for a fixed age, this guy is defined for at least this many things. And then putting these two, well, just Doing the calculation, I get this is at least one minus two epsilon times n. Good. Um, and now we're essentially done. So we notice this tells me that um, whenever this guy is defined, I get this many outgoing edges. And this guy is defined for at least one minus epsilon m edges. So altogether, I get that there are almost m squared edges. And so if I reverse it, I find that um, for almost every vertex in this digraph, um, well, sorry, almost every vertex in this digraph has large n degree, which is effectively what we need. So if I have an F with large n degree, then it means that for this F, there are many ages such that this thing holds. So this was my B. All right, um, so this proves the claim. Um, so this tells me that, okay, my claim told me that for almost every pair E and F, I can satisfy these two properties. So here they are again. Um, and now I want to show just given one pair that satisfies these two properties, I can find a tight cycle. Okay, um, so just to remind you, my good properties are the following two. So um, Q of F and E is defined, and there are many edges, edges H such that these two paths are defined, and I can put them together to form a tight path from E to F. But uh, and now, yeah, now we just want to put things together. So final drawing, perhaps. Um, here is my E, here is my F. And here is my pool of ages. Okay. Um, so I want to do this looping around. So I want to collect a path like this, a path like this, and a path like this, and put them together. So I have to start. I kind of have no choice. Okay, I guess let's, let's call this. Going from F to E, I have no choice. I just take this Q of F and E. But here I have a lot of choices. And using these choices, I will make sure that I don't, don't repeat vertices. And that's how I get my tight, tight cycle. So I need to find an edge in here such that um, this guy, P of E and H, doesn't repeat vertices here and also that um, this guy p of h and f doesn't repeat vertices here good um so so let's make sure we can do that okay so i have my fixed path here which has l vertices um and so in order to make sure that this this purple or pink part of the path is good. It doesn't repeat anything. Uh, it just means that I have to avoid L vertices. But this is 
this we can do again by this robust reachability property. So I know that there are at most for each vertex um, in this path Q of F and E, there are at most epsilon M over L bad path, bad ages. Um, right. And since I have L vertices in my path Q, then in total I have at most epsilon M bad edges H in the sense that this part might intersect with this part, right? Because the outgoing path from E are, have this robust property, no vertex is overused. Okay, um, but as I said initially, we have this kind of annoying thing that the same cannot be said for ingoing edges into F. However, the way we chose Q is kind of saves us here. Um, Right, so Q is chosen to just avoid the vertices that are overused here. So if I have a, any vertex that I have in my Q is not in, so if I have a vertex here, it's not in B of F. So it's not in the set of vertices that are overused here. And so for every vertex here, it is such that it appears in at most epsilon m over l in going edges. Okay, so every vertex again rules out at most epsilon m over l. We have at most l vertices in my path. So altogether, I have at most epsilon m edges h that are bad in the sense that this bit intersects this bit. Um, and that's it. So I have, I have a pool of at least m over two edges. I ruled out at most two epsilon m, and so assuming epsilon is small enough, I get many age, many ages that can be used to complete a cycle like this. Um, and this this completes my proof. Okay, um, so just to finish, I want to say that. Um, this proof can be used to prove other things. So I'll um, say them kind of shortly. So these other things are already known, um, unfortunately for me maybe, but they give a different proof to the existing one. So the first thing um, says the following. So suppose I'm given a properly edge colored graph. So this means that edges that share vertex have to have different colors. And suppose that this graph has n vertices and at least some constant times n times log n to the five edges, then this properly colored graph contains, has to contain a rainbow cycle. For a rainbow cycle, I mean that all edges um, have distinct colors like this. Okay, um, so basically you can get it using the same proof, except that you need a notion of expansion um, suitable for, for this setting. So it's a completed, well, a different setup. Um, so it needs a different notion of expansion. And the one I use is due to Kao Zhang, Abhishek Matupo, and Liana Yepremen. Um, and this result was already, already proved in a very nice paper by um, Oliver Janser, and he proved a slightly better bound than this. Instead of this five, he has a four here. Okay, um, and another thing he can do, which again can be reproved using um, the arguments that I showed today is the following. So suppose now I'm given a graph on n vertices, which has at least this many edges. So at least constant times n to the two minus one over r times log n to the five over r then such a graph, um, well, this. I think there is. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I see. Right. Wonderful. <laughs> right, uh, thank you. Um, so again, I have a graph with this many edges. I claim that this graph has to contain an R blow up of the cycle, where an R blow up of the cycle is something that looks like this. I take a cycle and I replace 
each vertex by an independent set of size r and each edge by a complete um, by a krr a complete bipartite graph um, good so um, yeah i guess i wanted to say this this bound should be kind of tight because this should be the number the true number of krr of course we don't know that um, so anyway this this result kind of shows that if you allow for a little bit more than instead of just one krr you can get like chain them into a cycle um, and in this case i get a slightly better bound than oliver so he got a seven here um, not that this was really a competition uh, and also here we need again we need a notion of expansion but also it's it kind of surprising uh, connection to a container result or um, like balanced so to to use like my proof i need a balanced super saturation result um by morris and saxton uh which yeah oliver kind of needed something a bit weaker which he could prove by hand but um if we want to apply my proof then then we need this this connection which is uh, kind of cool um and yeah so what else do i want to say uh, i guess i should mention that um, these kind of connections were um observed in a joint work with myself with this group tau abhishek and the Permian. good um right so so i guess i showed you my um proof and i also kind of argued that it might be like these arguments might be useful elsewhere um for example they can be used to prove these guys uh, so just to mention, I, I said that this this is very different to what Oliver does. So what Oliver does, he's he kind of counts um, like homomorphisms or you can say that he counts um, closed walks. of given length. Um, so this is very nice and also kind of a useful thing that we used in this uh, paper, but um, it cannot really handle a directed setting. So he couldn't really apply his stuff to these tight cycles. All right. Um, so now I'll just mention a couple of open problems. So first, just a reminder of um, what we are talking about. So f sub r of n is the maximum number of edges in an R graph on n vertices, which has no type cycles. Um, so the best bounds are lower bound is by Barnabas Janser of um, roughly n to the r minus one times log n over log log n. And what I get is an upper bound of n to the r minus one times log n to the five. So would be interesting, probably hard to determine where we lie. And I think probably if you go the direction of expanders, then you're never going to get the tight bound. Maybe you can improve it a little. Uh, right. So this is about forbidding all tight cycles. Now you can ask like a very natural question. What happens if we forbid a certain like cycle a certain cycle length um, and this was indeed asked by david Conlon, uh, and he asked the following question is it true that there is a constant c that depends on r such that um, if i forbid tight cycles of length l where l is larger than r and divisible by r then um, i cannot have more than n to the r minus one plus constant over r. Okay, so we really need this divisibility condition because otherwise just taking an r partite r graph would have 
no cycles. I mean, if, if L is not divisible by R, then we can have very dense graphs that do not contain tight cycle length L. So we kind of are forced to talk to have this divisibility condition. Um, and this is trying to emulate what happens for graphs. So for graphs, um, we have, I guess, a one here. And I probably meant this. This probably a typo should be an L here. OK, so this is kind of asking, well, it seems, it seems hard to determine the extremal number of a tight cycle of length L, uh, but maybe we can not quite determine, but still get something that well, of like a bound that looks a bit like what happens for graphs. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, interesting question. I, tried thinking about it, but didn't really get anywhere. Um, and finally, like these rainbow cycles. So let GN be the maximum number of edges in a properly edge colored graph on n vertices with no rainbow cycles. Um, so what can we say about this? Well, what I said in the previous slide essentially shows that this G of n is at most constant times n times log n to the five. And we have an upper bound of constant times n times log n, which okay, you can you can get it quite easily using a hypercube. Um, and these guys, Kivash Mubai, Sudakov, and Verstrat got a slightly better bound, like improved the bound that you get from a hypercube by a constant factor. Um, but yeah, like very interesting question. Um, to, to improve, I guess the expectation is that this is the correct bound, um, but again, probably hard. Right, um, so this is everything that I have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? So I have a, a small one, but it's more a very vague question. But I just know, I mean, for, for trees, people are also interested in counting how many trees there are. If yeah. that's a labeled vertex set, right? Um, so if you look at these cycle-free hypergraphs as generalizations of trees, has this been studied of how many different cycle-free R graphs there can be? Oh, how many? Um... Or even maximal ones, I guess. Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, I don't know. Okay. But yeah. it's no, it's a reasonable question, or all these counting things make sense, but I, I don't know. Not really. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. All right. Are there any other questions? I guess not. In that case, thank you again, Swam. I will stop.